series called Names of God. Names of God. Okay? Here's a slide. You know, there's a slide that has all kinds of different names of God. It's just a piece of art that somebody put together. And you can see all of these cool names of God. And we're not going to go through all, you know, all of them. But we are going to, week by week, take an aspect of God's name, or one of His names, and develop it. Okay? The name, as we mentioned, there's two things. First is the meaning of the name, and two, the significance. And we talked about here in Hawaii as a culture, right? We know that uh, a lot of us have long middle names. My middle name is 16 letters long, and it has a meaning. My, my tutu named me Kukuloha Oino Ole. And she, I was my mother's firstborn, and she, my tutu named me, okay? And she gave me that name. That name means my beloved never been forgotten. Okay? So for a name, there's a meaning and a significance. Right? We see Daniel here. Daniel is stated that that's a prophet's name from the Bible. Right? And so all of our names have a meaning and they have a significance. Yeah, awesome. And so God has designed it that way. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to look at the Word of God today and see exactly the meaning of God's name. An example, the significance of His name. We're going to see some awesome examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament of His name. Okay? We put this slide up last week. Not too many people know what this is. This is a fancy word. It's called the Tetragrammaton. Okay? This is the holy and divine name of God. Okay? Tetragrammaton. And you've heard it before if you've come to a large chapel. But we are, we're putting it out there. This is the holy name of God. Okay? And we talked about there in Genesis chapter 2, 4. And made a reference to this name. Okay? Right here. Th those letters mean Y-H-W-H. That's where the, we get the name Yahweh. Or the name Jehovah. We'll spend a little time in the weeks to come developing that. But that's where it comes from. It comes from... This tetragrammaton, or these four letters, Y H W H, okay, the holy name of God. We said to think about and write down the names of God that you have heard, that you know, that you've experienced, right? If you've been around in Bible studies or been around people who have a relationship with God, with Jesus, many times they'll refer to God with certain names. So I want you to think about those names. I want you to think about what Jesus said. His name was. And we'll develop that a little bit. I'm cueing it so that you can remember those things that you've learned. Those things that God has shared with you. That you've heard. That you know. And some of them, again, that you've experienced. God's name is just not something that we just write on the wall. God's name is something that you and I experience. That, that you and I experience. Okay? And so we, we're going we're gonna to see that today. Okay? There's another slide that just has another piece of art that shows all of uh, the names of God, you know, uh, here in this uh, here in this slide. But I want you to write this down. Okay, whatever word sticks out to you, I want you to write it down. What God is holy. He is sacred. He is distinct. He is ultimate. He is set apart. God is above everything. You can write down one or two if it sticks out to you. Okay, I'll say it again. God is holy, sacred, distinct ultimate set apart God is above everything okay? everything and everyone no one can compare to who he is no one or nothing he's in the ultimate realm in heaven he rules the entire not just the universe he rules everything everything he is God okay just like we were singing this morning about holy holy right we hit we sing it but do we know what it means do we know what it means? Holy is something that is sacred. He's above everything else. He said nothing else compares to Him. That's why we're singing, man. Holy is the Lord. And holy, holy, holy. And we're saying those things. And reading those things in our spirit. That's what He's saying. Nothing else compares to who God is. Okay? This is what you and I need to know on a practical level this morning. God loves relationships and covenants. God did not create a bunch of robots. 
He didn't wire us and program us. All of our complexity, the human body, the human mind, right? In all of its complexity. He didn't leave a chip in there and say, we worship Yahweh. We worship Yahweh. No, no. He created us as beings to worship Him with our own free will. Everybody understand that? He gave us a choice to be in a love relationship with Him. That's why it says God loves relationships and covenants. I think so many times Christians go around and say, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. And people have no concept of what that means. Okay? But if you use it like this, you say God loves you, and He would love a relationship with you. Okay? We can understand that. Because as human beings, we relate to one another, right? We say God loves relationships and covenants. Covenants again, right? Covenants are sacred things to God. Okay? It's an agreement. You and God are, you know, you're going to see He's the God of covenant this morning. You're going to see examples of He's the God of covenant with people just like you and I. Okay? So God loves relationships and covenants. Keep that in mind as we go through the Bible study this morning. When you go out and share with your faith with people, talk about that. Tell them how much God loves, loves them, and would love a relationship with them. How much you would love to spend time with them and to get to know them and talk to them, eat with them, hang out with them. Okay? That's what you and I need to be sharing with people today. Not religion. Not a bunch of rules. Relationships and covenants. God is faithful to keep His end of the deal. He is always faithful to keep His end of the deal. We're going to look at a portion of Scripture this morning that's going to kind of give us the foundation of where we're going to go this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open it. If, if you don't have your Bibles, you can look up here this morning and follow along. Okay? The story is found here in Exodus, the second book of the Bible. It's the first 15 verses. It says now, okay, now Moses, you remember Moses, the little baby, right? He was ordered to be killed, and right, mommy put him in the river on a basket, floated down the river, that Moses, okay? Moses was Hanai, right? He was Hanai, he was adopted, and so he went through a lot of transition in his life. But God ultimately, even in the midst of him, right, being denied or being orphaned or being given away, was still what? God still had a divine plan in his life. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father. So Moses had grown up, right? He's here, right? He's, he's his father-in-law. He's helping taking care of the, the, his father-in-law's pasture. Jethro was the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. The mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. Okay? And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. And we've seen it in movies, we've seen this particular story a number of times, right? We've heard it, read, right in Sunday school. We're very familiar with the story. But this is how God chooses to speak to Moses. And why is it, why we look at the Bible and say, okay, if this is how God speaks, can God speak like that to you and I today? Of course He can, right? Of course He can. But so many times again, the church mindset, is to come, to listen to whoever's on the podium, or to listen to, you know. But man, we got to go back to God's Word and see what it says about God's Word, speaking to individuals just like you and I. So here's a few things, right? The angel of the Lord appears to him, how? In a blazing fire. Where? In the midst of a bush. And he, Moses, and behold, the, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So he sees the fire, but there's no ashes, right? It's not going out, it's just... It's like a holy glow, okay? And it was interesting because Moses, again, Moses was pursuing. He was like, wow, look at this supernatural thing that's going on. And he began to pursue. Well, this is what it says. It continues. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, what? Moses, Moses. Called him by his name. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Remove your sandals from your feet. Why? For the place on which you stand is holy ground. Remember, it's sacred. You're in God's presence. Okay? And so here he said, 
he also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. He was like, man, something supernatural, something sacred, something way beyond I've ever seen in my life is happening right now. I don't even know how to process this in my mind, right? But notice again how God identifies himself to Moses. He says, I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Okay? God is using, right, his family using these illustrations of these patriarchs to minister, to speak to him, so he can identify with God. God is not saying, I'm some stranger, and this is, you know, right? He's making, he's bringing it down to Moses' level, speaking to Moses in everyday language that he can understand. Okay? Our first point, again, is God keeps all of his promises to you and your family. God keeps all of his promises. You can take a promise from God to the bank. Okay? He can be trusted with the promise that he gives you. God is not like us. We make promises, and sometimes, right, we don't fulfill our end of that promise. God is not like you and I. Thank you that he is not like you and I. God keeps all of his promises to you and your family. Again, there in verse 6, he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Okay? For you and I today, you know, people who live in Hawaii, I tell you this, it would be as if, right, all of our elite, all of our ancestors, those who have put their faith, those who have put their faith in Jehovah, those who have put their faith in Jesus. Remember I told you my tutu name Right? She named him because she followed Jesus. She worshipped Jesus. They were in the ministry at a little Hawaiian church near Honolulu called Kamuilili. Okay? And for years they served the Lord. And as they served the Lord, it would be like this today. Right? It would be like saying, Oh, the God of, right? My mother is an incredible name. It would be like saying, Oh, the God of my tutu. <laughs> my tutu man and my tutu. Well, they, they had enormous faith in Jehovah, in Jesus. And even before that, my family, my ancestors, they had a full, complete faith. And you and I are byproducts, many of us here are byproducts of what? Of their faith, of their prayers, of their love today. So it's just like saying, right? The God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You and I, we can think about many times the people, the God, the special family members that God has placed in our lives to have the influence on who we are today. It helped make us who we are today. We're going to look at the first portion of scripture on Abraham. Remember, because he said he was the God of Abraham. It's in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. You remember about God. He is the God of what? Relationships and the God of covenants. Okay? He's a personal God. Here, in Genesis, excuse me, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, he says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That was the covenant, the agreement, the conversation, the deal that Jehovah had with Abraham. Okay, you understand that in the very beginning of the Bible there. Okay, he's giving us, we, we can look at scripture and see what the relationship was between him and Abram. You notice Abram, hasn't, he hasn't even been renamed yet. So this is there in the very beginning. This is right in the, the very beginning of the relationship. Because you remember, shortly after this, he will rename Abram to Abraham, the father of many nations. Okay, so here we see the God of Abraham. Okay, so he's sitting there talking to Moses. Remember the scene, the burning bush. 
he's speaking is, hey, remember, I'm the God of Abraham. The next one he said is, is the God of Isaac, right? And so we can see here in Genesis chapter 26, verses 2 through 5. Genesis chapter 26, verses 2 through 5. Again, in conversation with this man named Isaac. It says, the Lord, Jehovah, appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn or travel in this land. And I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all of these lands. And I will establish the oath, the deal, the agreement, which I swore to your father Abraham. That's what we just read about right now. I, Jehovah speaking, will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And I will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. You see, when Jehovah was speaking face to face on a personal level, okay, with Abraham, Abraham had a clear understanding of what God expected of him. And that with that clear understanding, he began to obey or do the things that God asked him to do. And because of that, it set it up, it set the stage for the future generations, his sons, his grandchildren, his family, to be blessed. You understand that? You and I don't just make choices that affect you and I in the present. You and I are making choices today that are going to affect our eternity. Choices today that are going to affect our family presently and in the future. So here again, the God of Isaac, Genesis chapter 26, verses 2 through 5. Notice a repeated theme here. From generation to generation, God is saying, if you, you stay in love with me, okay? If you stay in love with me, I will bless you. I will bless your descendants. All of these promises begin to fall on these people. He said, not only that, there's going to be a land transfer, okay? I'm going to give you nation. I'm going to give you land. Things that you didn't own before, that weren't in your possession, I'm going to bring to you. That's the promise of goodness and love of God. Some of you have experienced that in your lives. How God has bought things to you. How God has done things for you that you don't deserve, right? It just, you, you were in a love relationship with God, and He begins to pour out His blessing over you. I thank God because if it was just on my personal, my, my behavior when I was a childhood, I probably would have skipped out on all of God's blessings because I was a, I was a punk kid. Okay? But thank God for mom who prayed me through that punk stage. Thank God for grandma who believed that Jesus, Jehovah, can change anybody. And they tirelessly prayed for God to touch a young man's life. Here we are, you guys. This is the, we are today, the fulfillment of, again, the prayers, the faith, and the love of our family from generation to generation. It also says that he's the God of Jacob. So let's look at Genesis chapter 28, verses 13 through 15. Genesis chapter 28, verses 13 through 15. And behold, Jehovah stood above it and said, okay, the context here again, he's speaking with Jacob, okay? This is the story about Jacob's ladder, where Jacob is tired, he's in the season of transition, he's on the moon, he lays his head down, God gives him a supernatural vision. In this supernatural vision, he begins to see these things, okay? And he says here, continuing, I am Jehovah, the God of your father Abraham. And the God of Isaac. Notice how he identifies himself over and over again. He keeps deferring back to this. Saying, hey, remember me. I'm, never, I'm not just a God who showed up today on the scene. I've been a God who has been faithful to keep my word with your family. I've been a God who has kept my end of the promise over you. Okay? Even before you were born, I knew what was going to happen. And I made a relationship, a covenant with your family many years ago. We'll continue again. It says, The God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, as you remember, was lying down. I will give it to you and your descendants. He said, Where are your heads sleeping right now? I'm going to transfer it over to you. Verse 14, Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east 
and to the north and to the south. The idea is dust. I mean, you're right, if you hold a hand of dust, it's uncountable, right? That's what God is saying to him. I'm going to make you guys like that, and I'm going to scatter you, I'm going to spread you guys all throughout the world. And we have seen God perform this promise, okay? Because why? Today we see the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people, where? On every country, on every corner of the earth, God has fulfilled this promise and brought the Jewish people all over the place, including Hawaii. God has performed His word and His promise, His covenant, and His relationship to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the descendants. And the descendants. Okay? And notice again, it continues, And in you and in your descendants shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. All of the families of the earth, including you and I, are blessed through what? Through this covenant, through this promise, through this conversation that they're having. Right? Verse 15, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. How do you like that about God? He's speaking face to face to so him supernaturally in a dream. And he's saying, guess what, Jacob? I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to stay right by your side until everything that I told you is going to happen. If you're going through something in your life, if you're going through something in your life, and it's tough, this is God's promise for you. Okay? This is God's promise. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to just go, oh, okay, we're happy there. Sorry, I've got to go. i got to go help somebody else. God is always faithful. God is always loved. And He will see you through to the very end. He is the God of Isaac. God of, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No one compares to Him. No one. Okay? Remember this truth again. God keeps all of His promises to you individually and to your family as a unit, as a team, as a even corporately, he keeps his promises. I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Sometimes we read a portion of a verse like that in verse 6, and we just move on without a full understanding of what it really means. That's why we pause from time to time, take it to the Word of God, extract it so that it becomes a personal promise to you and I. Why? So we can put our feet down on solid ground, on the rock, and walk in it. We're not just going around with a bunch of information. Remember that? We talked about that earlier, right? We can walk and trust God's promises, His eternal proven word, all the time. We go back again to the story there in Exodus chapter 3. He says, Then Jehovah said, I have surely, Moses, seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. Okay? Or these heavy bosses. For I am aware of their sufferings. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians. And to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land. To a land flowing with milk and honey. To the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Remember we were talking, God was talking about the land transfer. Remember as we were looking in Genesis? The book before Exodus, and we were looking there, and he was saying, hey, these are the things that are going to happen in the future, okay? This is hundreds of years later, hundreds of years later. God is going to perform his word, come through on his promise. And here he is, talking to Moses again, through a bush, right? Through the burning bush. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are now oppressing them. I am aware of their current circumstances. I know what's going on. He's not sleeping. God is not taking a nap when you're going through things in your life. God is not unaware. You know, he's like, oh, oops, I missed that. That's not God. That's not our God. Okay? There might be some other God sleeping, but not our God. Jesus, Jehovah, the Holy Spirit. Okay? In verse 10, it continues. Therefore, because of this oppression, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Moses is sitting there like, what? You're going to send me to who? To Pharaoh. Pharaoh's the most powerful man on the earth at that time. He's the one in charge 
I am going to send you, Moses, to Pharaoh. Why? He tells him. So that you may bring my people, who? The sons of Israel, out of Egypt. I want you to bring them out. I want you to lead the way. But Moses, again, remember conversation, relation, right? Relational. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. You can appreciate the heart of Moses. He said, why would you pick me? I mean, there's all kinds of other people. Why don't you pick them? Moses had just spent a season of failure. A season of setback. A season, I remember where he was when God appeared to him. He was in the west side of the wilderness. Right? He was going through some very desert times. Right? He was going through some very lonely times. He was no longer in the palace. Taking back in all the good food, dressed all fancy. He was out in the desert, right? Out of the wilderness. And notice here his humility, the humility of Moses. God, why would you choose somebody like me to deliver our people? In verse 12, and he said, Certainly, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. Okay? So not only does God say, No, I got the right person. I didn't make a mistake. Not only that, he says, I am going to what? I'm going to show you a sign. Something is going to happen in the supernatural that verifies that you are the person that I chose. Okay? So it is with you and I today. God has chosen us individually, and he will bear witness to that over and over again. Supernatural. And if you walk in the supernatural, the supernatural is your lifestyle. Wow! It's exciting. It's absolutely incredible, mind-blowing to walk day by day, moment by moment, in the supernatural. I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, the woo, I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the supernatural, unexplainable presence of God. Okay? A lot of times I encounter Christians, people who call themselves Christians, people who act like Christians, and they're acting as if they're walking in the supernatural. When in, in truth, in reality, they are walking in the natural. They are walking in religion. They are walking in the ways of man. Jesus told them. Jesus told them, you nullify. You nullify. You nullify. You make neutral the word of God. His supernatural being because of your religion. Because of your traditions. Okay? Today, you and I have the privilege, the privilege, to walk in the supernatural. The supernatural window isn't open from 7 to 9 a.m. Okay? That's not how it goes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The supernatural, we have access to the supernatural one. Supernatural one. All the time. And you and I have the access and the privilege to walk in the supernatural. Okay? So he says here, I'm going to show you a sign. And that sign is going to verify that I sent you. When you have bought the people out of Egypt, you shall, you shall worship God at this mountain. So he gives them clear instructions. He didn't tell them, hey, he goes, hey, I'm going to show you a sign. I want you to go where? To Mount Horeb and to worship. He's giving them clear, simple instructions. Then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me. So he's playing it out in his mind. He's going, hey, you're sending me to this place to go talk to the man in charge who right? rules the whole world, right? You're going to send me there. I'm going to walk in. They want to kill me, right? Because of what I did in my past. They want to kill me. They want to hurt me. They put a hit on me. Things aren't going to go that well, right? But here he goes again. He comes back in and he goes, I'm playing it out of my head. Uh, they might say to me, what is his name? What is this God's name? What shall I say to him? I love it. Remember we saw the burning, burning bush, right? Fire, the bush is burning, right? You would think you're a little crazy if you're talking to a burning bush and you're having this long conversation with him, right? Hey, what's your name? Burning bush, right? And this voice is coming out and you have to take off your slip you know, right? That's the scene that we're at right now, okay? He says, what is his name? What shall I say to him? Notice verse 14. God said to Moses, I am I am. Can we say that out loud together? Ready? Begin. I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, 
I am the center to you. I am the center to you. Good. Woo! I am. That's all he said. What's your name? I am. And this word I am derives from or comes from the holy name of God. YHWH. And we're going to see that in the weeks to come. But this is very important. That we not only call his past into the present, but we also focus on what's going on between him and Moses. Between Jehovah and Moses. And he goes, I am is sending you. I am is commissioning you. I am is going to walk with you right into Pharaoh's place. And I am is going to displace some stuff over this nation, over this king, over these people. I am. I want you to look up here this truth. It says, I am. And I just put a few empty lines in there. Kind of go along with your Bible study notes. I want you to write down what he is to you today. I want you to take a moment, take a moment and write down what he, the I am, is to you today. Okay? Write down what he is to you today. It's very personal. That's why I'm not even putting nothing else up because sometimes we can insert things into human. I want God and you to have that heart-to-heart -heart connection right now. I want you and God to have that spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection right now. And I want you to write down what he is to you today. I am blank. I am blank. I am blank. You fill in the blanks. What he is to you for you today. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amazing. He is amazing. He is amazing. Thank you, God. We'll give you the glory. We'll give you the glory. This is the last part here in, in Exodus. The last verse. Okay, in Exodus, not just the last verse of the story. It says, God furthermore said to Moses, so he continues the conversation. Thus he shall say to the sons of Israel. Now he's saying, he's saying, hey, you're going to say this to Pharaoh, but now I want you to say this to my people, my sons. It's a term of endearment. Okay? I want you to share with them those that I have a relationship with. Those that I made promises hundreds of years ago. I want you to speak to that group. And he says, the Lord, the God of your fathers. I love it. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. And notice what it says here. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. To all generations. To all generations. You will know that name, he says, that name, the I am. You will know that name for all generations. Now we're going to make a shift. In our closing, we're going to make a shift. We're going to look into the window of the New Testament and Jesus. So we established, remember again, Genesis, right? God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We talked about here in Exodus, God's about to do a great move, a supernatural thing through a chosen one called Moses. Right? He's about to defy or come against who? Pharaoh, the greatest ruler at that time. Who else? The Egyptians, the most powerful and most wealthy army that there is. Right? That's who God is sending Moses to. Right? God is revealing, having a conversation with them in the wilderness through a burning bush. Remember all of that. And says that he is the I am. Now we're going to look into a different window. We're going to look into the New Testament and Jesus. Okay? So, if you look at John chapter 5, we're going to look at, uh, excuse me, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verses 56 through 58. John chapter 8, verses 56 through 58. Okay? There Jesus is. He's having a conversation. He's having a conversation with some people who are religious. With some people who, again, know the Bible. Okay? They know the Old Testament. So they are having this confrontation. 
conversation with these religious leaders. Jesus speaking, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old, Jesus, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, pay attention to this portion of the conversation, because Jesus replies, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was even born, I am. Before Abraham was even born, I am. What was their response when he said this? Therefore, because of what he said, what did he just say? He just said that he is the I am, right? He is the I am. He identified himself with, as the one who had the conversation with Abraham, right? And Isaac and Jacob. Notice what they do. These Jews, they pick up stones to throw at him. Why? Because it was absolute blasphemy that Jesus, a mere man, would say that he is Yahweh. They were blaspheming God. They said, how dare you say that you are the I Am? How dare you identify yourself as the one who had the conversation with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob? How dare you? And they picked up rocks because they were going to stone him to death according to what the law said. They were going to take it to the next level and kill Jesus in their religious zealousness. Okay? But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. He walked in the supernatural. He just moved right through the crowd. They're about to stone him. But I'm sure they didn't go, oh, we're going to get out. Right? It just tells us right here. He got out of there. Okay? So there he identifies himself. We see as we look into the window of the New Testament, we see an example, one example, of Jesus identifying himself as the I am. And notice the response of people. If he would have said something else, they wouldn't have picked up stones and thrown at him. If he would have said he was something else, they wouldn't have done it. But because he said he was the I am, that demanded a response from them. They were going to kill him. As we continue to look through the window of the New Testament, we're going to look up John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verses 4 through 6. John chapter 18, verses 4 through 6. Thank you, God, for your word. So Jesus, Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, there was nothing secret to Jesus, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? Who are you looking for, you guys? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas, the betrayer, also who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They're coming to betray Jesus. They're coming to arrest him. They're coming because they're going to put him to death. And notice what happens. They're looking for the man. They're coming through the crowds. They're walking in the garden. And they're going, where is he? Which one of these guys is he? Who are you looking for? They go, we're looking for Jesus. From where? From Nazareth. That'd be like somebody calling your name, calling your city. Right? It was a lot of Jesus at the but he said, hey, we're looking for this specific person. Notice again how Jesus identifies himself in the garden. Jesus says, I am he. I am he. And notice again what happens when he makes that declaration that he is the I am. It says, they drew back and fell to the ground. Just him speaking that name demanded a supernatural response. They hit the ground. They fell back. Just him speaking that name. And I would imagine, I would imagine Jesus didn't go, I am the I am. You know, that's not probably how it happened. Jesus probably just said, I am. And Paul. Paul goes, whoo, right on the ground. He just hit the ground. Because he declared he is the Holy One. 
He is the ancient one. He is the great I am, as in Exodus chapter 3. He is the great I am, as he revealed himself personally to Moses, his chosen one. He says, I am he. And they drew back and fell to the ground. Okay? What an awesome thing that we can see it from the Old Testament, from the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis. Look at a cool story that God left, left us in Exodus, right? The second book of the Bible, right? In an everyday thing. I like how it is just because it's just everyday stuff, you guys. He didn't say, hey, Moses washed himself in the river. He put on the holy robe. He put on the gold and he went to the temple. And there he met the holy presence of God. Now Moses was on the wilderness, a little dirty, probably a little stinky, doing some work. And that day, in that place, God appeared to him. You understand that? You hear that? In your everyday life, in your everyday circumstance, God wants to meet you where you're at. Okay? He's not just here in the temple, in the church. Everybody following that? God wants to appear to you supernaturally. He wants to have a conversation with you. He wants to go into covenant with you. Okay? He's not giving you a list of rules. He wants to talk about you. He wants to tell you what his plan is for your life. And he wants you to go, yay or nay. He's giving you the choice, not twisting your arm. If you want his plan for your life, his plan is way better than your plan. Okay? That's what we read in the Bible. Okay? His plan is awesome. And when you accept his plan, not only will you be blessed, but you will be blessed from generation to generation to generation. And then we see Jesus. The I am manifest. In human form, just like you and I. And he's just talking, walking around, going through some stuff. People are trying to kill him everywhere he goes. That's why we, we use that story today, right? In the book of John, people are trying to kill him, right? They're trying to trick him. They're trying to lie against him. They're trying to destroy him. And then there, his friends betray him. His people turn against him, right? But he's still what? He's still who he is. He's the great one. And so we, you and I, have the great privilege of looking at the Bible and understanding these truths for our everyday life. Don't get it twisted, you guys. Don't get it twisted. God is interested in the relationship with you wherever you're at today. Wherever you're at today. Okay? He wants to make covenant with you today. Not going by, but today. This is our closing verse. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13. It says, Call on the name of the Lord, and you shall be saved. Call on the name of I am. Call on the name of Yahweh, Y H W H, and you shall be, not like me, you shall be saved. So I'll say this this morning. If you don't have a relationship with God, relationship meaning you know Him, He knows you, covenant, which means that you're in covenant with Him, you're in agreement. He's made himself known to you. You are in covenant. Just like this. You're in covenant with him. Okay? I say this. This is how simple it is. You don't got to do 15, 20, 30 things. All you got to do, the Bible says, is call on the name. Right? That's our series, right? The names of God. The name of God. You got to just call on his name. And you will be saved. Call on his name and you will be saved. That's as simple as it gets for you and I today. Call on the I Am for whatever you need Him to, to be today. If you need a Savior, call on that, the I Am to be your Savior. If you need the Comforter, call on the I Am to be your Comforter. If you need healing, call on the I Am to heal you. Right? If you need deliverance because you're in bondage, remember the story about the, right? the nature of Israel, the people of Israel, the sons of Israel, they're in bondage. Right? If you're in bondage, call on the I Am to deliver you. Whatever it is today, whatever it is, you and I have the privilege and invitation to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. If you don't call on His name, you will not be saved. You understand that? If you refuse to call on His name, you will not be saved. I think sometimes people need to hear that contrast. Because for a long time, many years of my life, I just 
I live life without God. I live life without the I am. The I am loved me and wanted a relationship with me, right? Remember I talked to you about my lineage and how much my parents and my, you know, everybody loved God, right? And when it came to me, I was just, I was out there, right? There came a day, April 3rd, 1995, where I had to call the name of the I am and get saved. And that's what it is. It was something personal. I didn't even say it. I didn't really, I didn't even say it out loud. I just, I called him the name of the in my heart. And I, I got completely, completely saved that moment that I did this. Did what it says here in Romans 10. May the Spirit of God speak to you today. Individually. It's for you. So I give an invitation every week where I talk to people, right, on the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross for what? For all of your sins, all of your mistakes. He will forgive you. He will forgive you if you come and accept the cross of Jesus Christ. He will forgive you for all your mistakes, all your failures. And guess what? This might be a secret to you, but you're still going to screw up even after you accept Jesus. And he'll forgive that too because of the cross. And how's that for you? <laughs> yeah, clap me. Yeah, woo! Right? That's awesome. Right? You said it right. Just call on the name of the Lord. You will be saved. Okay? Here's a prayer. And this prayer isn't like the only prayer. It's just a type of prayer that we pray every week. Right? To just kind of put some words to but some people. They don't know how to pray. I didn't know how to pray. On April 3rd, 1995, there was a person just like this. And he was helping me with the prayer. He was actually on TV in another room at a church, and I was following it along on some TV. Okay, so that's kind of, but this is a prayer to help you and I this morning. If that's you this morning, he wants a relationship and a covenant with you this morning. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you, and he forgives you. And so we're going to say this prayer out loud together as a family in closing. Okay? God hears your heart. You don't care about the words, like I said. You know, He hears your heart. So we can say this prayer out loud together. Uh, family, ready to begin. God, please forgive me for all my mistakes and failures. Help me turn from living life my own selfish way. And give me the strength to follow you from this day forward. I accept your free gift of eternal life. Jesus, be my Lord. I believe that you are risen and alive. Please set me free. Please heal me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.